God is good. Today I want to talk to you about the purification of praise. Praise and worship has always been a subject that, you know, every minister has a vein. You have something that you study. I love to listen to Jimmy Evans. His vein is end times prophecy. And so he, he actually has a thing where he talks about that now. His other vein is marriage. And um, him and his wife teach on marriage and stuff. And one of the reasons why that's a vein for him is because they have a restored marriage. And so when you go, when you go through something, often the storms that you go through, you often end up, that ends up being your testimony. So you can walk other people through it because you've been there. You know, who better to share than someone who's actually been through it? Um, some people say things, okay, why would you go to somebody who's never raised a child for how to raise a child? It's that kind of thing, you know? So I love to listen to him, though, when he speaks about end-time prophecy because that's a vein of his. Well, for me, praise and worship has always been a vein. It's always been something that God has always leaded me back to. How does that relate with worship? How does that relate with praise? And I've always loved to study praise and worship, but I never thought about praise being a purification process. But I can look back in my life, and the moments where God said, Jasta, I just want you to praise, in the middle of what you're going through, I didn't realize he was purifying me. I didn't recognize it. And I'd, So I'm going to take you to some things in the scripture, but first I want to start with Luke 18. In Luke 18, we're going to start with verse 1. Also, Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to turn coward, faint, lose heart, or give up. Now, I'm doing this in the Amplified. Um, Amplified Classic is what it is. Um, he said in a certain city. I love how he started with that. So Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not to turn coward and faint or lose heart and give up. He's prepping you. Luke is telling you this is what this is about. And I'm going to tell you what the parable is. He said in a certain city there was a judge who neither reverenced and feared God nor respected or considered man. Why is that important? I asked the Lord, I said, what is important about that? He said, because we often think if I ask the right person, I'll get what I need. This is showing you that it's, it's not even the right person. This is somebody who does not fear God, does not care about human beings, other people. In fact, it says they don't even care. They don't even consider man. Sounds like our government. They don't really care about the poor. They don't really care what your issue is because they really don't care about you. They don't even care about God who actually put them in the position that they're in. They don't care about the one day that they'll stand before God and be judged by him. They don't care. She had to address a person like that. Oh, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him saying, protect and defend and give me justice against my adversary. Well, she had a lot of guts. First of all, she was going to somebody who didn't care about God, doesn't care about other people, and doesn't care that he has to help. And she just keeps coming. And for a time, he wouldn't do it. But later he said to himself, though I have neither reverence or fear for God, nor respect or consideration for man, yet this widow, that woman, she knows I don't like people. She knows I don't care about God. And yet this woman keeps showing up on my doorstep. I love that woman. <laughs> this widow continues to bother me. I will defend and protect and avenge her lest she give me intolerable annoyance and wear me out by her continual coming, or at the last, she come and rail on me and assault me and strangle me. He was afraid of her showing up in the middle of the night and cuffing him one. He was getting, she wore him down. Now, I'm going to tell you something. We often let the enemy wear us down. 
He's not talking. I'm going to tell you, the judge he's talking about here is the enemy. We let the enemy wear us. Do you know what the Bible says in the Old Testament? It states that his, he comes to wear down the saints. The enemy comes to wear us out. No. I might get a little discouraged sometimes, but when I find my guts, I'm going to wear you down. When I get my spine back up, I'm coming back for you. We have to get to the place where we see the enemy and say, no, absolutely not. I'm going to wear you out long before you wear me down. Because God's not done with me yet. And yet this widow would not give up. So then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not our just God defend and protect and avenge his elect, his chosen ones, who cry to him day and night? Will he defer them and delay help on their behalf? I tell you that he will defend and protect and avenge them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persistent faith in the earth? On the earth. Will he find faith? Or will the saints of God have finally been worn down by the enemy and it's over? The past two years, I have seen a wear down of the church. People are weary. They don't want to get out of their pajamas and come to church anymore. They don't want to lift their hands and praise. This is too much work. My body's tired and it's weary. I'm going to tell you something about praise. You don't do it because you feel it. You do it because it's obedience. And it's sometimes the first time you raise your hand, you're pushing all of heaven. Again. You're just pushing through the brass. You're pushing through it. You have to push the train to get it to move and to get your momentum back. It's not easy. But once you begin it and it begins to stir in you, it's not, it's not hard then because it begins to stir. Paul said you have to stir up that gift that was in you, that was laid into you by the laying on the hands. You have to stir up the gift. That's what praying in the spirit does. But praise, when we begin to pray in the spirit, when we begin to praise, they all meld together because they all work together. It's not just one thing. Often when I'm praying, I end up praying in the spirit. And then I'm singing in the spirit because they all flow to each other. I'm only going to pray. I'm not going to sing. No, because that goes with that. They, they lead into each other. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find persistent faith on the earth? Not just a little bit of faith. Not just somebody going, yeah, I believe. I believe a little in you. No, I believe in you. All of my, all of my faith, all of me, I believe with all of my might, all of my strength. Where did our praise go? My mom sent me this video. And I, I thought about showing it, and then I thought, you guys are going to laugh. You're going to laugh hysterically. It was actually, was that Kenneth Hagin meaning? Yeah. Our, our praise back in the 80s and the 90s was interesting. <laughs> Did you ever go back and look at some of those videos? Go on YouTube. It's, yeah, oh, yeah, just hysterical. But, I mean, everybody, we just pounded on the keyboard and we banged down those drums and everybody was everybody in the house was like this I mean, it was just, you were clapping with all of your might I looked out in the audience and there's people just dancing and I mean it was crazy where did our praise go now you'll see people act like that if they go to a concert you'll see people act like that if they go to their favorite baseball game or their favorite football game but you don't see them act like that in church. No, we get in church and we try to look all perfect and look really good and pucker up and I have to look spiritual. That's not spiritual. That is something else. I, don't, I, won't, I won't even say the word. Um, that's not spiritual. 
Yeah, exactly. It does. It kind of looks a little constipated there. It's, it's not spiritual. There's a scripture in Luke where it says Jesus rejoiced in spirit in that very hour. Go look up that word in the Strong's. Rejoiced means to jump for joy. Wait a minute. Jesus rejoiced. He actually praised in front of the disciples. He did something besides our Father who art in heaven. This look that we have of I'm trying to look holy. Really? When the angels get a revelation of God's holiness, they scream, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. They begin to worship and they flap their wings, the ones that have wings, and they begin to fly around and go nuts. When's the last time you got a revelation of God and went crazy with praise and said, God, I can't contain it. You're so good. I love the little meme. There's a little black girl and she's, God is so good. And she's got herself up, you know, this little attitude. He's so good like this. I just, I love it. Because when's the last time? Have you ever? When's the last time you hooped and hollered for your favorite team? You might be able to tell me that one. You know, if you compare how we praise other things compared to how we praise God, who wins? Who wins? I've watched people hoop and holler for the former president. When's the last time you went to church and hooped and hollered like that for God? Who gets our praise? And who gets it? All of it. And the best of it. So in the same chapter, oh, so there's the high praise in the church is gone. This is part of this. There's an actual thing online, they did an article, saying, we love this, the new songwriters for church, but where did the high praise go? It's missing. And you know how hard it is for me to find, and Sherry knows this, it's very difficult for us to find fast songs. They, they might write 20 beautiful worship songs, gorgeous, wonderful Here's the difference between praise and worship. Praise is my outer expression of God's goodness and what he's doing. It's, it's in obedience to who he is and what he's doing. But worship is me coming down and bowing low. It's, it's a different, they're two totally different things, and yet they focus, they function together. And a lot of us are like, oh, just do a slow song. We'll be good. Let's just worship. We don't need high praise. No, you need high praise because if you don't have high praise, walls don't break down in worship. That's not where they break down. Walls break down in praise. Chains break in praise. Bondages come off in praise. Worship is where you bow your heart low and you become to the throne and you love on the Father. There's a difference there. And you got to have high praise, and yet we have no high praise being written at all. Hardly at all. Because people have forgotten it. But they don't have any problem praising other things. That is a problem, you guys. Our praise, it's not a song. It's about, I praise you, God. And sometimes it's just verbal. God, I just worship you. I praise you with all of my heart. I give you praise. I'm not going to thank anyone else, just you, for all you've done. And you begin to give him praise. It's about giving him the best and the first. Our praise first. So in the same passage, he also told this parable to some people who trusted in themselves and were confident that they were righteous and then they were upright in right standing with God and scorned and made nothing of all the rest of men. They were self-righteous. They actually put themselves in the position of God. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. Two men went up to the temple. So Jesus is telling them, he's talking about this woman who goes to the judge and is persistent. And she's full of faith. 
And he's saying, will I find faith on the earth? And he recognizes that he's talking to people in the congregation that their hearts are not right with the Lord. And so he says, ah, hold on a second. And he tells them this parable because there were people in the audience who trusted themselves in their own righteousness and not God's. That's the reason why he told this. So then he says there's two men who go up to the temple and close to pray, and one of them is a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, why did he mention, why did he say Pharisee and tax collector? You know why? They were equal. They were both bad guys. One of them was not good. They were both bad guys. The Pharisee, Jesus, remember, he called them vipers and the sons of Satan. And tax collectors were the lowest of the low. They were Jews who chose to work for Rome. And they took from the poor. And not only did they take Rome's part and take money for Rome, they a lot of times up the the value of your taxes, made you pay more, and then they pocketed it. So Jesus was telling these two men that came to the temple, and they were both thieves. They were both equal. And yet, listen to the attitude of the Pharisee. So the Pharisee took his stand out ostentatiously and began to pray. He held himself in a position like, I am better than everybody. Stick your nose up in the air. And begin to pray thus before and with himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the rest of men. There are extortioners and robbers and swindlers, unrighteous in heart and life, adulterers, and even like this tax collector here. Let me tell you something about praise. You have to get your eyes off of everyone else around you in order to praise God. That means you have to quit your judgments. You can't judge even the worship team if you're really praising God. They hit a sour note. I just can't praise to that. They were off rhythm with this. Well, then you're not praising God. You're focused on what you want, and it's all about you. You can't focus on your neighbor. Well, I hate how they worship. I can't stand it. They raise their hand. They're so loud. Really? You're so focused on everyone else, you can't focus on him. Oh, I can't believe that per person would praise. I saw them this week. I know where they went. I know what they were doing. Really? Really? And why didn't you pray for them? Why didn't you maybe address them and go and say, hey, are you struggling with this? Can I help you? Where do we restore each other in kindness? Where do we restore each other in grace? Hmm. God, oh, God, you're getting in our business. Oh, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I gain. Mm -mm -mm. Now, let me tell you something. He just took a position. This is not a humble position. This is not a position of worship. God, don't you see everything that I do? I'm the one that's involved. I do all this stuff. I can't believe you would listen to him. Let me tell you something about these, the position of this Pharisee. This is the position that I'm starting to see, and it is coming into the church, but it's really in the new age, new thought, I am God thing. Okay? There's a couple men online, and if you pay attention to anyone who talks, there's a few guys, they're really into this new age, new thought stuff. And they do a lot of that. And they do a lot of, you're so wonderful, you're so great, you are the blessed of the universe. They talk like this. And I'm sitting back going, whoa. And they, they talk horrible about some of the people that, yes, are definitely obviously evil going on. But yet I sit back and go, you're not any different. You're not humble before, the, before God. You have not cleansed yourself before the Lord. In fact, they believe they are God. That's the truth. 
And that's what this person is doing. They actually believe that they're in the position of God, that I can point out everyone else but never really deal with me. But the tax collector, remember, equal guys, just as evil, doing crazy stuff. Merely standing at a distance would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. You know why? Because when there's humility in your heart and you come into the holy presence of God, it humbles you. It humbles you. It, it makes you go, God, I'm actually not even worthy to stand here. I'm really not. I know it's only by your grace. I know it's only by the presence of Jesus I even get to be here. I know it's only by the blood of the lamb because I did not earn it. And it humbles you. It puts you in such a different position. But if you come in there with the attitude that somehow you're God and you deserve this and you've earned it, you'll walk in like the Pharisee. And that's not real praise. That's not real praise. Because a heart of worship is I bow low. It's, it's, it's I've come down and brought myself down. But the tax collector, merely standing in distance, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, be favorable. Be gracious to me. I'm especially a wicked sinner, especially this wicked sinner that I am. It's like where Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. I was a murderer. I murdered people in the church. He tells the truth. I'm the chief of them. I, I've heard people talk like, well, people in the church, you know, they're so judgmental. Shut up. First of all, that phrase in itself is judgmental. You have, you've become the Pharisee. Be careful of how you judge other people. Keep your praise pure. God began to deal with me, and he said, Be, keep your praise pure. God, I'm just frustrated. Keep your praise pure. Get your focus off of everything else and just get it on me and me alone. And simply bow your heart down to me. When we praise the Lord, we have to check our hearts. How are we coming before him? Is it with purity or is it with arrogance? There was a time, and I saw this in churches, there was an arrogance in our praise. In fact, churches competed, their worship teams competed all the time, and they competed their praise. We had this great worship service, and we praised for hours, and there was no scripture. We didn't have that. You don't have the power of God in your church. There was this attitude that came out of the church 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You know you saw it. You know you heard it. You heard the judgments. That is not praise. That is Pharisee. Pharisee, I scream Pharisee. That's what that is. That's that arrogant attitude of we can do it better than you. Where was the humbleness of God I come? Simply with no nothing. I have nothing. Just me. Who am I? I love David said, who am I? What, what am I? What am I? You have the earth as your footstool, and here I am, mere man, coming to you. I tell you, this man who went down to his home justified, forgiven, and upright, in right standing with God, rather than the other man. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Will Jesus find faith in us? Do we need God or are we so full of ourselves and our lives that we no longer need him? I know we sing songs like we sang last week. I need you. Oh, I need you. But is that just lip service? Do we really need God or are we just doing okay on our own? Some people really don't need God. You know, when you say things like, God, I need you, he gets in your crazy he gets into your mess. He actually gets into things that you don't like. Him to get in. God, don't get into that. That's mine. But it needs to change. Well, I don't want you to change it. But you saying I need you. But I don't want you there. I want you over here. But don't you go into my spot. 
don't you dare go into my bedroom. I have things in there that I don't want anyone knowing about. But if you sing, I need him, then you're giving him entrance to it all. Otherwise, don't sing it. Don't sing it just to sing it. Mean it. Do you know the worship that changes the atmosphere is the worship where it comes from? It's meant. It's meant. If we just sing a song to sing it while the worship team's singing, so I got to sing the song. No, do you mean it? Do you mean those words that you're singing? I'm going to tell you, I know Pastor Sherry and I both, we pick these songs together. And when we look at these songs, we are not looking at them for, I love the rhythm of the song. If the words don't line up, who cares about the rhythm? It's about the words because the words have to go down in my heart. And the words have to mean something. Do they mean something to us? God, I need you. Yeah, I need you. I need you even in the areas that I really don't want to change, but I need to change. I need you to purify me. Can't just be lip service. We have answers for everything. You can go on Google and find answers. How often? We probably search engine Google far more than we do the Father or the Holy Spirit. How often do you ask the Holy Spirit for something? Versus Google. I did something yesterday. You guys are going to crack up. So this scripture that I'm going to share in a few minutes. I thought, Lord, I really need to like look that up in the Strong's. I just want to make sure I have the words right. And I said, oh, I could just Google it. And the Lord said, I want you to get your book out. I said, God, that book is huge. I hate that thing. <laughs> it is. Have you ever seen a Strong's Concordance? Now, my Strong's Concordance was my husband's father strong concordance because I've never gotten myself a new one because they're really expensive. And it's nice because they're more a little more condensed, they're a little smaller, and they're still this big. They're that thick. And about this, this book is about yay thick and it's about yay big. So it's a much bigger one. It's an old one. We have the binding on the back. We've actually had to put duct tape. Black duct tape on this big red book. And this was how I originally studied when we first started teaching the youth 25 years ago when Matt and I first got married. And I would lay this book out. You can't lay it out on like one of those little TV trays or card tables because it's so heavy. It makes the whole thing feel like it's going to collapse. So you have to sit at a dining room table or a desk. And my desk, there's no space. So I went, oh. So I had to sit at the table and open this thing up, and then I'm like, do I even remember how to use this thing? Because you have to look up the numbers and the verse. And, and I'm doing this, and God goes, see, you can do this without Google. You can do this and just look up my word and study. I said, Lord, I think I'm going to leave it on the table so I remind myself to get it off the shelf. Now, I study the word, but I do it differently. And I, he's taking me back to some old school. He said, you got to do this. This is how I want you to do it. Oh, Lord. He's working on me. But if I don't obey him, and then I go and say, well, I praise you, what is my praise worth if there's no obedience? Okay, here's a, here's a way to understand this. My little kid comes up to me and says, Mama, I love you. Really? I asked you to clean up your room, and you didn't do it. But you love me. You love me because you want me to do something for you, but you can't do anything for me. Is that a fair exchange? No. Do that with your husband or your wife. Honey, I love you. I really need you to do this for me today. I need this done. Okay. But there's a fair exchange there. You know, there's not a whole lot in our relationship with God where there's a fair exchange because in, in our relationship with the Lord, there's no fairness of it. We get the best end, of, we get the good end of the deal. But there is a fair exchange when it comes to obedience because when God says, I just want you to be obedient, yes, we may give up some things, but he's got something better in store. 
I love the meme that t- that shows Jesus standing there and he says, just give it to me. And she's got this little tiny teddy bear, but he's got this massive like six foot one. We don't realize that even in that there's not a fair exchange. Yet we're so scared to give him our obedience. But he says, I'm going to give you something better. We go to doctors for every illness. And I'm not knocking doctors. There's a purpose for them. Okay? You don't know how to pray if you don't know what's wrong. A lot of people are like, well, why would you take Ben to the doctor? Why not just go up and get prayer for him? Because we didn't even know how to pray. (laughs) I mean, I said, God, heal him. But we don't know what's wrong. We didn't even know where to begin till we had some kind of a diagnosis, right? We have counselors for every problem. A lot of times we run to a counselor and we don't run to the counselor. Now, I'm not knocking counselors because there is a time that the Holy Spirit is meant to speak through someone. He has lined you up with a counselor that is meant to speak into your life, but you don't want them to touch your junk. You don't want God to go into your bedroom, but you can sing, I need you, Lord. But you don't want a counselor to point out what you're afraid of someone seeing. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I know what people love privacy, and there is a level of privacy that we all keep, and that's okay. I get it. But if you are so private that nothing ever changes in you, you have a problem. If you are so private that God can never get into those inner places and begin to work on you and change you, you're not private, you're hiding. There's a difference. And when you begin to praise God and begin to worship and get in with him, you can't hide your your junk. It kind of shows up. And God begins to deal with it. How do I know? Because he's done this with me. That's how I know. That's how I know because he did it to David. David began to worship, and then all of a sudden, all the little things come to the surface. Like, where's that coming from? Well, because praise and worship is a purification process. As you begin to do it, and you begin to be obedient to praise God in the hard times, praise him in the good times, and you begin to worship God every day, he begins to purify you. Why? Because he wants to take you deeper. And only the pure in heart will see God. Only the pure in heart will see him. So he has to take you through purification to get there. Now, all of you guys are saved, right? You've given your life to the Lord. You're saved. That's different. Salvation is given. You don't have to earn it. But there is a process that we have to walk through as believers, and it's called purification. You come to Christ as you come. You're dirty, you're scuzzy, you've got your sins, you've got your sin nature. He gives you his nature, but you still got to get in the bathtub. And you got to scrub, and you got to wash, and you got to clean the clothes, and you got to work, and it's a process. And for everybody, it's a different work. And it's a process. And praise and worship is part of the process. That's where he cleans us. It's where he cleanses us. He begins to wash us with his word. He begins to wash us. What? To purify us so that we can go before the throne. We have an easy access. So when we go before the throne, we don't feel like, I'm such a snail. So you don't look like Eeyore walking into the throne. No, you're a child of the Most High. He wants you to walk in, not in self-righteousness, but in Christ's righteousness. But you can't walk in Christ's righteousness when you don't even have a clue you're righteous. Okay? I'm not talking about false humility that puts yourself down. That's not what I'm talking about. Confidence in who Christ is in you, but not your own self Righteousness, where you judge everyone else. Don't be a Pharisee. It's a bad idea. (laughs) It's not nice. Do we even need God? Those are the things that God began to show me. Do we even need, do I need you? Or do I live my life? I already got it kind of figured out. 
this is my world, this is my little box, and I got a kind of laid out, and everything's cool. And God, when I have a problem, I'll come to you. Really? God wants a relationship with us like he had with Adam, where he came down in the cool of the day and just walked with him. Not when we only go to him because we have a problem. If your kids only talk to you when they had a problem, if your husband and wife only talk to you when there's a problem, how much of a marriage do you have? How much of a relationship with your children do you have? If all we ever talk with each other is when something's going wrong, that's not a relationship. It's not. It's actually counter-independence, like our dependence on each other. And actually, a lot of times, it becomes very unhealthy. Go look at codependent relationships. They're not pretty. That's not our dependence on God is he is dependent on us, too. He wants you. He's a jealous God. That's a whole nother sermon. All right. That kept coming in here, and I said, no, that's another sermon. I had to push that one aside. Do we seek God? Do we receive God's rebuke to make changes in our life? Will our, do we allow God to challenge us? Do we let him? Do we let him in, go into those deep places in our life? Are we so stuck that we cannot mature and cannot grow? So... One of, the, one of the problems that we all have, everybody in this room has this issue. I don't care if you're 12, and I don't care if you're 62. We all have this problem. We get to a certain point in our life, and we think, this is, this is life, okay. I'm good with this. And we lay down. Like, okay, I'm good. I've learned all I can learn. I've done all I can do. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. That's it. I'm done. We don't challenge ourselves. We don't grow. We don't mature. We just get stuck. And it happens to all of us. We all struggle with this area. But the Holy Spirit wants us to grow and mature and learn. And that's why he wants us to consistently, persistently seek the Father and seek the Holy Spirit daily so that we keep growing and don't just get stuck. There was a term that came out back in the 80s and 90s, and there was a song Amy Grant used to sing called I'm Just a Fat Baby. And it was about being a spiritual Christian who gets fed all the time, but you do nothing with it, and you just sit there in your pampers and become fat. How many of us are so fat spiritually, but we've done nothing with it? How do you get fat? Sit down, keep consuming, but never put out. That's the problem. We keep consuming, but we're not putting out. Here's how you always put out. Praise and worship. That's how you put out. If you quit praising and worshiping God, then you are just a fat baby spiritually. Because you're receiving, but you are not putting out anything. If you're not giving to people and loving on people, be careful. You might just be consuming too much. And not giving. It's a, it's a constant move. As I'm given to, I should, freely I'm given, so freely I should give. There has to be a movement in our walk with the Lord. Or if not, we turn into couch potatoes who just sit and get bigger and bigger, but not stronger. Notice this. If you don't use your muscles, you get weak. Doesn't mean we become stronger. Nope, we just keep consuming. In Luke 19, 13, Jesus says, And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said to them, Occupy till I come. What is he talking about? He's talking about the, ta the, the parable of the talents. And he says to them, Here's your talents. Here's what I'm going to give to you. Occupy till I come. We are told until Jesus returns, we are to occupy. What does that mean? Do what you've been, give, what you've been given with. Do something with it. We were never called 
So back in the, I think it's the 13th century, during the time, it, it was early, early church. Um, it was actually earlier than that, excuse me. But during the century when um, St. Nicholas was alive, which was actually during the early part of the church, it was during the Council of Nicaea because he was there. It was believed that the highest calling for a Christian was to sell all of their stuff, give it to the poor, and go live up in the hills and be a monk. Yet that's not occupying till I come. How is that occupying? But they believed that because they took it very literally when Jesus said to sell everything and give it to the poor. But Jesus was talking to the specific person who said, I'd done all this stuff. What else can I do? What he was saying is, you haven't done all this. I know there's a part of your heart. What he was saying is, you say you need God and you need salvation. He opened the curtain to the bedroom and said, but I see your riches. That's what he was doing. He wasn't saying that's the greatest way to serve the Lord. Because how would the gospel get around otherwise? So there was a belief in the church that that's what you did. You sold everything and became a monk. That's not what I'm talking about. You don't take everything that God gave you, sell it all, and go up to the hills and don't talk to anybody. What's the point? Kind of sounds like COVID. I'm, I'm, I don't want to catch anything, so I'm just going to stay home, never go to the house of God, and just kind of stay away from everybody. Listen, we were never called to be monks. We weren't, okay? Um, that doesn't work. Just go watch Sister Act. You'll know it doesn't work. Those people, they did everything. They lived in their little convent. They didn't do anything until somebody showed up and said, what are you doing? The community around you needs you. It doesn't work. We, we're not called to be monks like that. But Jesus said, occupy till I come. Why is that important? Because occupy means grow. Do something. You can't just sit around and be a fat baby spiritually. Do something with what's been given to you. If, if, there's no, if you're not growing, what's the purpose of life? If there's no flow, what's the purpose then? No, I'm just living here till the rapture. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Really? I've heard that attitude from believers. Well, you know, I'm 80 years old. There's really nothing new for me. You know, God's not done with us. Whatever your age is, he's not done with you. He's way bigger than that, absolutely. God ain't done with you. But if you lay down and just decide you're done, then we're just going to walk right over the top and just keep going. Don't, don't be like that. God, I want to learn. I want to grow until you come. I don't want to lay down and just, no, I got stuff to do. So Jesus tells him the parable of the talents. Now remember, you remember the story. He gives him 10, he gives him five, he gives him one. And the one with one, the other two go and actually apply the talents and do something with them, and it grows. It's an amazing concept. You put a seed in the ground, you cover it with some dirt, you put some water on it, and you get a plant. It's, they made it grow. They put their talents somewhere and made them double. But the one with one decided to bury it in the ground. Now, that wasn't a seed, so that didn't work. I, I'm sorry. I have yet to see go plant a quarter in the ground and make a money tree. That would be awesome if that was possible. My dad used to say money doesn't grow on trees. Well, actually, technically, it does. But it's made from trees. It doesn't grow on them. So, but, because we used to argue with that all the time. Well, that doesn't work when it's coins. Because you're right, it doesn't grow on trees. It don't. And it doesn't produce like that. But you have to make it produce somehow. So he puts this coin in the ground, buries it. So when the master comes back, the other ones show him, look, you gave this to us. This is what we've done. We've occupied till you came back. And the other one said, I went and hit it. And he called him wicked. You wicked servant. 
unfaithful. You guys, when Jesus returns, I want him to say you were faithful. You did with what I gave you, you multiplied it. You did something with it. I don't want him to look at me and go, you wicked servant who stuck it in the ground and just laid around and did nothing with it. Well, God, I thought I was too old. I came to the kingdom and I was 65. And I just thought I was too old to do anything. Really? That's not how the kingdom works. Go back to the other parable Jesus taught. The people who came in in the 11th hour worked just as hard as the ones who came in in the beginning. You are not meant to be fat and lazy and sitting and do nothing. Get up and move and function and be a part of the kingdom. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And we're supposed to occupy till he comes. Part of that is our praise and our worship. You are not meant to be stuck. One of the hardest parts about praise and worship is that as we begin to worship, a lot of times God pulls things on our hearts like, you need to forgive so-and-so. You need to deal with this part of your heart that's hurt. You were hurt back here in your childhood, but you've never let me heal it. Sometimes we pull back on our worship because don't, don't touch that part of my heart. See, that's that bedroom curtain. Don't touch that part of me. I can't. I can't give that to you because I, oh, I am going to be angry for the, till the day I die at this person. You do realize that the sin that other people commit, even against you, is equalized. It's all equalized. So their sin is not greater than yours. This was a big revelation. I was in worship when God said that to me. I was on my face, in my bedroom, on the carpet, when I was weeping and saying, God, this hurts. This betrayal hurts so much, I cannot. How do I forgive it? And he said, your sin is no different than theirs. You say that to some people, and they will read at you. Don't you dare tell me. I am a better person than that. I would never hurt so-and-so and do that and that and that. Your sin is no different. And you know, it made me weep. It made me bring myself back down and go, you're right, God. Now, I'm not talking about restoration. I'm talking about forgiveness. Letting the vengeance go. That's what forgiveness is. Letting the vengeance go. Letting the I have to make them pay. No. Letting it go. And letting God deal with the situation. But many times it's in worship. It's in that place of praise that God says, I want you to be obedient and let me have it. Mm. God, you're meddling. Yes, I'm meddling. Because he's purifying us. Do we give God our leftovers? Does he get the best part of our praise or the leftovers? So if you go back to the story of Cain and Abel, Cain gives God a sacrifice. It's that time, that, the year they're supposed to give sacrifice. So Cain gives God a vegetable offering because that's what he grows. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's because Abel gave him a lamb, and that's the correct offering. That is not what that's about at all. It's really not. If you go and really look it up, it doesn't, yes, God prefers the lamb offering because it was a, to look like Christ. But they give offerings all the time of grapes and grain and different things. So it was not about what he gave. It was about what portion he gave because more than likely he gave him the leftover crud. He gave him the corn that was on the stalks and was a little more, he didn't give the first of his crop. He gave the leftovers. Now, how many of you guys want rotten vegetables when you go to the store? No, we pick through it and we feel the, the avocados to make sure they're not hard, but they're not squash. They're that perfect little right between. And if they're a little hard, you think, I'll eat it tomorrow. It'll be right by tomorrow. And you have it all. I hate buying vegetables from a store and I get home and they're rotten in two hours. Really? That does happen from some stores. You think you got a really good deal. And really what you got was a rotten vegetable that was probably sprayed with some wax so it looks really good on the surface. 
not knowing the inside of the fruit was a rotten. I've gotten an apple that the outside was completely beautiful. And we, I bit into it, and it was rotten inside. I don't even know how that happens, but it does. God knew Cain's heart. He knew what Cain had done. He didn't accept the sacrifice because it wasn't his best. But how many times do we come to God and we give him our leftovers? God, I'm so tired. I've already worked this many hours. I just praise you, Lord. Good night. It's just the leftovers. We come on Sunday. I'm barely making it. Oh, God, I'll just give you this much. Do we give our best or are we just giving our leftovers? Can we go deeper? Yeah, absolutely. So my first and my best. Do we praise God in the middle of our storms or do we worry and we whine? When we're struggling in an area, do we refuse to grow and change because I don't want God to touch this? We refuse the purification process of praise. We refuse to humble our hearts. And really worship, and that means to bow low. Proverbs 27, 21. In the King James, Proverbs 27, 21, in the King James, says, As the fining pot for silver and the furnace for gold, so is a man to his praise. In Proverbs 27, 21, in the Amplified, it says, As the refining pot for silver... And the furnace for gold, it brings forth all the impurities of the metal. In order to purify metal, you have to put it in the fire, and all the impurities come up to the surface and are scraped off, and that's how you purify the metal. We should know the process. We've talked about it before, right? So let a man be in his trial of praise, ridding himself all that is base and insincere, For a man is judged by what he praises and what he boasts. We're judged by our praise. We're judged for how we take praise and how we give praise. Ooh. Hold on a second. I thought God judges me for my heart. God knows your heart, so he already knows your praise. Because he knows he knows what's really in our he knows our motive. Am I coming to God to pray so I can look good for everybody? You know, there was a season in church, I remember. I I heard people say, I don't really know why I'm doing it. Just everybody is. So I don't want to be left out. You know, God knows. He knows when we're faking it, you guys. And he knows when we're being real. He knows when we're sincere and when we're insincere. Praise has a purification process. As we come to the Father, he brings those things to the surface for a reason. If when God brings something to the surface and exposes it in our life and says, I want you to deal with that, me and you got to deal with this issue, and you push it back down inside the molten molten gold because you refuse to purify it, You have just told the Lord, I will not obey to you. I will not submit to your sovereign hand. You will not purify me. Now, I'm going to tell you what happens when you do that. He'll purify you a different way. There's two purification processes you will go through in life. Number one is praise. If you'll do it in obedience, he'll walk you through it. But if you smush that down and refuse... The next purification process is trial. And he's going to let the trial come till it purifies you. And until you bow. And that was my smacker this week. Sometimes we say, Lord, God, why am I going through this trial? And I said, oh, God. No, I realize It could be something I refused to let you deal with in the first place. So now I'm going through it this way because I refuse to be obedient right here. Sometimes God says, nope, you're not going to stay on this straight path. I have to take you to this detour and take you through the wilderness because you would not let me have that. 
And I'm going to tell you something about God. He's not doing this to you. He's doing it for you. He loves you. And he is a jealous God who wants the absolute best for you. So I get this call from my daughter this week. Mom, and we were talking about a situation, and I said, I, you know, I'm careful what wisdom I give you on this because I want you to make the decision. Love gives the choice. But I said to her, I said, you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. You need to go and spend time with the Father and hear what he says for you. Because in the end, this is about you obeying him, not me. Yeah, I need to go and I need to listen to him. Why? Because she's going to go, if she doesn't listen to God on this, she'll go through another trial until she listens. Some of you guys have wondered why you keep going through the same trial. Go back to your last obedience. Go back to where you pushed that down and said, I'm not going to obey. Oh, God, don't touch that. Go back to that spot. Because I'm telling you, if you get obedient in that area, you'll get out of that trial. It, it has to do with your obedience. There are things God has told me to be obedient with. He's been telling me for six months to pull out my strong concordance. I know you guys think that's stupid, but for me, this was a big issue. God, I hate that book. It's so freaking big. It's enormous. I hate flipping pages and going through this thing. No. You, ha you know what it is? I got lazy. It's not that I can't Google it and find the same answer because the answer I found was there. I, it's not that I can't. He was dealing with my laziness. He was, he was dealing with the impurity that was in the metal way down at the bottom he was poking at it. And you think, well, what trial did you go through? Time. My time was being stolen from me. I said, Lord, why, why is my time just going? Because you weren't obedient where I told you to be obedient? Come on, that doesn't seem like a big deal. It is a big deal. It's a big deal because sometimes the smallest obediences are huge issues. That thing that you said, God, I'm not going to tithe. I don't have to tithe. It doesn't get me to heaven. No, it doesn't get you to heaven. But it purifies your wallet. And it purifies your intentions. Because you don't have the best of intentions with your money. Because you have not given me the best and the first. And I said to. You keep asking me for a job. Or keep asking me for raises. But you won't give me that tenth. Oh. And yet there are benefits to being a tither that you miss. Like your fruit will not cast its, it won't cast before it's time in the field. I learned that one when we were praying for a baby. Because I'm a tither, my babies will not miscarry. I'm going to claim that. I'm going to stand on it and I'm going to walk it. Even when I was in pain with Benjamin and thought I was miscarrying, that's all I quoted the whole night. To get through that. Even when he was born a month early. God you said I wouldn't cast my fruit before it's time in the field. And I'm a tither who gives my first. That's my benefit. God I'm a tither. Hmm. But if you're not obedient. And you wonder why you keep going around the same mountain in the same trial. Because God's trying to purify you in your obedience. Praise is obedience. They go hand in hand. There are times I've gone through storms and the Lord said, yes, I just want you to praise me. Don't complain. Mm. And I'm a woman. I want to complain. And the men are going, oh, I complain too. Well, then, you know, same thing. I want to vent. I want to scream at the wall. I want to get mad. No. Where's your praise? Praise me in the middle of this. Be obedient. Let God move like only he can move. Hmm. And our trials were purified. And what's, what's inside of us comes out. And in our praise, we're purified. Our maturity is defined 
by who and what we praise, especially when we're going through trials. Do we praise ourselves? Do we magnify our circumstances or do we magnify God? You guys, you cannot lay in bed and hope and just ignore problems. They don't go away. In fact, most of the time they get worse. We have to face things head on. Now listen, there's a coming seriousness. We've been told this. I heard that from another minister this week. The Lord showed him that. Greg Locke, I think it was. So there is, a, there is some seriousness, seriousness coming. In fact, the scripture says to be sober, to put that on, be full of it. Now, it's not just talking about wine. That is part of it. But it's talking about get sober. Have your, the right mind. We have a society that not only is drunk on alcohol, but is high as a kite on a weed. And they smell like a skunk. And I don't care if you say it's for pain. Listen, Jesus wouldn't take, he refused on the cross in the worst agony, agony, refused to take the vinegar stuff that they gave him. Okay, now that was for pain. It was an instant relief, but he refused to because he wanted to have his mind in the middle of it. I remember my husband fighting off of opiates. I want my mind back. It's not worth it to lose your mind over it. I guarantee you God will heal when you're obedient to what he's asked you to do. Why am I saying that? I don't know. Because I keep walking through the store and all I smell is pot. We've got to, we need to be sober right now. We don't need to be losing our marbles. We need soberness in this world. Why? Because there's a seriousness. And I don't care how much you drug yourself up, it ain't going to go away just because you lay in bed and ignore it. That's not obedience. Obedience is dealing with what God's asked us to deal with. And it starts with our praise. In Luke 18, the woman that was persist per persistent before the judge, she was obedient to occupy what belonged to hers. And when it was even taken from her, she was unwavering in her faith to go before this evil judge and ask for it back. And she was persistent. She knew where her faith belonged, and she knew where her praise belonged. My grandpa used to say, prayer plus praise equals power. And I stood on that for a long time. That, God, I'm going to pray in faith, and I'm going to praise you in the middle of the storm. And I've always seen the power of God show up. Always. Because that is, if there's a formula you ever need, there's probably only one formula I will ever give you that has the same result. And that's that. If you will pray and you will keep your praise, not your complaints, keep your praise before God and praise him through the trial. There's power and he'll get you through. You won't stay stuck. And I've preached on this before. What you do in the middle of your storm will either stick you there or get you up through it. God never intended you to be stuck in the middle of something. But he does call you through it. But it's what you do right there. Prayer in the spirit is very important. You pray the perfect will of God. And it gives you strength. Praise magnifies God, not your trial. It magnifies what you're, it doesn't magnify what you're struggling with. It magnifies the Lord and makes him bigger and it brings you strength. Praise may not always change your circumstance, but it will change you. It softens you in the, as the clay in the potter's hands and it molds your heart. Praise is a sacrifice in obedience to the father's hands and to his sovereignty. We are not to quit, to lay down, or to give up. Revelations 3.10, that we have quoted this a million times, and we're going to keep quoting it because God has kind of made it the theme verse. Because you have kept my word of patience, I will also keep you in the hour of temptation, which shall come upon the whole world to try them that dwell on, upon the earth. Because we've kept his word. Because we've kept our praise in him. Praise God in your doubt. Praise God in the jail cell. Praise God in your bondage. Praise God in your brokenness. Praise him when you have fear. Praise him when you worry. 
Praise him when you have anxiety. Praise him when you have loneliness. Praise him in your lack. Praise him when there's trials and storms. Praise him when you feel crushed. Praise him when you feel frustrated. Praise him when you feel beaten and battered and worn and weary. Praise him in the waiting. Remember when we wait on God? They that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles. They will run and not be weary. Those that wait, what does waiting mean? To serve. Put your little towel on your arm and be a servant. God, I'm waiting on you. I'm praising you in the middle of this. I'm believing you're going to do something. Praise him for who he is and what he's done. Do you know one of the greatest ways to praise the Lord is just to simply begin to learn who he is? So here's who he is. Yahweh, the Lord God. He's Adonai, the Lord God, my master. He's Elohim, the Father God, our creator. Michael, can you pull up that song? He's done, our dad, sorry. I used to seeing Michael up there. Abba, Father, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, my provider. He's Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals me. He's my healer. Jehovah Nisi, he's my banner. He's my covering. He's my victory. Jehovah Shalom, he's my peace. Jehovah Tassid Kanu, he's my righteousness. Jehovah Shama, the Lord is here. Now, I just have to laugh because when I typed this in this morning, my thing changed it to Jehovah Sherman. <laughs> That'll make you laugh. It is Jehovah Shama. I know it by heart, so I'm like, oh, forget that. The Lord is here. It didn't recognize Shama. It didn't know what to do, so it changed it to Sherman. Oh, God. You are not Sherman, Lord. All right. <laughs> you are Jehovah Shama. The Lord is here. El Rohi, the God who sees. El Shaddai, the God Almighty. El Elyon, my Redeemer lives. If you've forgetten, forgotten who he is, you can look up all those names. There's many more of them. Begin to say who God is to you. I was in my car the other day, and sometimes things will just come up out of my spirit. But I thought, I got to write this down. You hold me steady. You won't let me fall. When I face the fiery furnace, you're always there. And when I face the storm, you're already there. You hold my heart. You save my tears. You haven't forgotten me because I'm written on your palm. I told the Lord this the other day. I said, thank you that I'm not just a number to you. My name is written on your hand because I matter. Our society makes us just a number. But to God, we're so much more. He's El Rohi. He's the God who sees. He sees me. He sees you. He sees me in those hard times, and he sees me in my failings. And yet he still loves me. He's my rock, my shelter, my firm foundation. And the Lord said, just write who I am to you. So I did. I typed it to myself. That's who he is to me. And when I praise him, he strengthens my heart. When I praise him, he heals my wounds. God, heal us. Heal us. Heal our wounds. Heal our weariness. Sometimes you can't, it's hard to praise God for what you need him to do. But if you can go back and remember what he's done for you and praise him there, 
go back and praise him to the memorial that you made of what he did for you in the past. Then you can recognize what he can do in the future. Sometimes we have to simply just say, God, we're just going to thank you for what you've done. Listen, he's always faithful. One of the things I love to do is praise him for his faithfulness. I am not always faithful. I'm not always consistent. I don't always get up at the same time every morning and go to the word like I should. I'm not faithful, but he is. Because he shows up even when I don't. He's so faithful. That's where our praise should go. Focus on his faithfulness, not us, not our problems. Focus on who he is. He's good, beyond good. And he's always good, and he always has the best of intentions for us. God, we're just going to praise you this morning. Go ahead, Dad. Let's thank him for what he's done.